Good morning, and welcome to the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist. Um, I want to say a special word of thanks. Our, our air conditioner was actually not running very well yesterday afternoon, and uh, Brad Kasiba dropped in after his birthday party and got it running. So, Woo! so uh, good, good stuff. Good stuff there. The call to worship this morning is actually a piece called A Call to Worship by UU Minister David Blanchard. Come down off the ladder, wash out that paintbrush, shake the sand out of your shoes, get up off your muddy knees and give the garden a morning off, fold up the newspaper, turn off the coffee pot, Close up the calendar already filled with dates and names and people and places that claim you. The church is ready for you to fill its rooms, to create its spirit, to generate its warmth, to kindle its light. This church is ready for you to make community, to create beauty, to bend it toward justice, to serve its ideals. This church is ready for you to be here, honoring our past, invigorating our present, and dreaming our future. This is your church. Here we are home. Here we are whole. Let us begin. So it's really interesting. Um, as I kind of wrote the, as I wrote the sermon. Um, I was, I was expecting, like, I'd begin with a, in a bad mood, and then I come, and there's this beautiful singing, and silence, and, and a band, and, and Glenn, and I'm like, oh, my mood is just, my mood is just lifted. A friend of mine, um, he happens to be a Christian minister, posted on Facebook about a month ago. It was early May, maybe, maybe mid-May. And he posted uh, about this big project in his church that he had earnestly hoped to accomplish this church year, but had put off, had procrastinated, and now was finding it difficult in mid-May to muster the motivation to achieve. And within minutes of him posting that, another friend of his, another minister, posted a snarky and honest response. He said, I just tell my congregation they shouldn't expect much from me after Easter. <laughs> and so that's kind of the spirit I found myself in this week, realizing that I had planned to preach an encapsulation of this church year, a state of the church sermon, if you will. And I'd be lying if, if as I sort of thought about what I might say, that I didn't regret that choice. Not, not because this is a year of regrets. In fact, it's been a wonderful year but because it's mid-June, and all I can think about is that next week at this time I'll be at the beach, and, and most every minister I know is feeling more than a little burned out, a little cooked, a little crispy in the middle of June. Do I really want to preach this sermon now? Why don't, when I come back, preach it when I come back in August, after I've had some vacation, a little travel, some afternoon naps, some days with no plans but reading a good book. And wouldn't that surely lead to a more charitable accounting of the state of the church? Because <laughs> right now I'm feeling, do you know, I have a, a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, and, and I know what she is like when she needs a nap. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's what uh, I, I almost put in notes. I should just come and say, I really need a nap, and then I'll be better. And so I'm trying to find that objective spirit. Objectively, it's been really a fine year, a year rich in successes and also a year rich in, in soul. This church year began last July with a month of sermons by graduates of my preaching practicum class who spoke their truths about kindness and community and career from the depths of their souls. And this year will end the same way it began, with another round of sermons by another class of the preaching practicum. And uh, they're, they're really, yeah, Eric's clapping. He's going to be in here in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> it'll be really good. You should, you should definitely be here. When we came back together last August, 
we kicked off the year with a great big marriage equality party, a party with cake and by really spirited and deeply felt testimonials by members of this church celebrating the Supreme Court decision from just one year ago. Doesn't it seem longer than a year? In September and October, we kicked off all our programs, and at the end of October, we had a successful auction. And you'll hear about uh, um, Kathy's uh, joy that she shared was for um, some of that. Um, the auction, by the way, raised the second largest amount of money we've ever raised, um, but it did have the most handsome chair that we've ever had. <laughs> In November, this sanctuary was transformed into a Jewish Russian shtetl, and our congregants, age 8 to age 80, and everywhere in between, were transformed by Glenn and by Carol Parker into a dynamic troupe of actors as we presented Fiddler on the Roof. And then in December, our choirs presented with symphonic accompaniment, a moving musical service based on the Jewish Sabbath service. In the second half of the year, we heard sermons addressing the racism and Islamophobia being addressed in our politics, addressing the demonization of transgender individuals in our state, and addressing the fascism on the rise in our nation. But we also put our faith into action, sending dozens of us to Raleigh on a frigid February morning to march with Reverend Barber, hosting a successful benefit concert for Syrian refugees, and a program this afternoon designed to create a deeper awareness of Islam, and sending dozens of us to Raleigh for Moral Mondays this spring, including my decision to commit civil disobedience and get arrested in House Bill 2. I remember, I remember walking through the crowd on my way into the legislative building and seeing off to my left one of our youth group leaders standing there with her friends. And I remember I just, as, as I walked in, I sort of stepped out of line and did a big high five. And I remember as I passed that she turned to her friend and saying, that's the minister of my church going to get arrested. <laughs> I was like, all right, that's the highlight of the year there. <laughs> in the winter of this past year, we marked with tremendous grief the passing of far too many beautiful souls in our congregation, members of our church family whom we miss deeply. One of those souls, Bud Goudreau, we honor this morning with flowers and hymns. And we have uh, Bud's beloved Jane Ann Hughes here with us from Twin Lakes. And this morning, looking back, we also honor the diligent work of the caring ministry for all they do and for all they continue to do for this community to hold us in our times of vulnerability and sadness. At the same time that we honored the memories of beloved members, we also launched uh, an ambitious and successful annual pledge drive that raised record amount and will successfully fund a robust budget in the coming year. Kudos to Maureen and to her entire team for a really great, really great pledge drive. In April, we hosted our first ever distinguished guest minister, a rocking service delivered by the amazing Reverend John Crestwell, and the worship ministry is sending me to General Assembly a week from now with directions on who I have to go um, wine and dine and ask to come preach next year. It's a, it's a big surprise unless you're on the worship ministry. In late spring, we celebrated our coming-of-age youth and our uh, youth who are rising up, and we held a second music service in which our combined choirs sang the word, word Alleluia 13,000 times. <laughs> and of course, there's so much I haven't even mentioned. I haven't even mentioned the tens of thousands of dollars we raised through Share the Plate or the members who helped us build our 20th Habitat for Humanity House, or our Religious Education Program for Children, or our Spiritual Education for Adults Program, or our Covenant Group Program, or our Quilters, or our Outdoors Connection Group, or our Nonfiction Book Club, or the Campus Ministry, or the Softball Team, or the Membership Program that welcomed in so many new members this year. And certainly I've forgotten far more than I've remembered. 
And now I think it was a good idea for me to write this sermon, because even though I'm running on fumes, I can also say without any reservations that at the end of my second year with you that I'm truly enjoying this ministry. And I'm glad I accepted this call and that it's a joy to call Chapel Hill home. It's been a good year, two good years, and I am happy to be here. That's the joy side. Yeah, I'm not... So that this is joy, and then the negative side, and then the middle side. So there's another side to the story, and the other side of the story is not like about you, really. It's about kind of this larger, the state of church, capital S, capital C, the state of the church. Because if you read news about congregations in larger American society, the picture that they paint is very different from what I see here on the ground. And by different, I mean doom and gloom. There are tons of articles and stories and pieces being written right now claiming that the congregation in America is dying in American religious life, that churches are financially unsustainable in the new economy, and that this expression, this kind of congregational expression of religious life is doomed, destined to go the way of the dodo. Um, have you read any articles like that? I, I, they come across my desk fairly regularly. Um, one such article that came across my desk a few weeks ago made an impassioned plea for ministers to dust off our resumes and begin planning for a future in some other profession besides minister. <laughs> Get out while you still can. They said, this is, was sent to me. I didn't know what to make of that. <laughs> Let me just say that I, I tend to regard writing on the future of religious institutions with a bit more than a grain of salt. In the 1960s, Time magazine ran a cover story announcing the death of God. Needless to say that news of God's death has been, was greatly exaggerated in 1960. And a decade and a half ago, we were told that megachurches were the wave of the future and that for the sake of our survival, our money should be invested in video screens and rock bands and hair gel for the minister or something. Um, which is to say that people who offer predictions and prognostications about religion don't really have the best track record. I've had this, this conversation with my colleague down the road, the senior minister at Eno River UU Fellowship, and I, call, I called him up and I said, Deb, so, so is, is the, the future of the congregation, is it, is it dying over there in Durham? And no, she answers with a smile, our, our membership is increasing, our programs are thriving. How is it over there in Chapel Hill, Tom? And I respond, we're thriving here. We've had hundreds of first-time visitors this year, and nearly 100 people have now taken our exploring membership class since we first offered it last June. And so there is this kind of discord, this disconnect between what the, the larger picture that's being written and what we experience here, it occurs to me that it's not just church, that there is a thread of thought through much of our culture that insists that we are living in the end times, that the world is about to end and that we are on the precipice of doom. That it's a, it's a, a message that actually uh, transcends political affiliation or worldview. Those on the right, religious or otherwise, warn about a war on Christian values, a government that wants to take over our lives and take away guns, about China and immigrants and Muslims and African Americans. The left, politically and religiously, shares this sense of impending emergency, though it understands the threat differently. For the left, religious, political, and otherwise, the world is coming to an end due to climate change, the widening gap between rich and poor, the corruption of democracy, and the disinvestment in education, healthcare, and social services. Truthfully, I find one of these diagnoses much more compelling and true than the other. But I would argue, I would argue that regardless of political persuasion, there is something distinctly and characteristically American in this attitude of foreboding, of restlessness and distress. Let me explain what I'm 
getting at here. I think it's actually a part of our, of our lives. I want to invite you to open your hymnal up to hymn number 304. It's a hymn we're not singing this morning because because I've pledged never to sing it. Um, <laughs> it was actually the first, the first time I, I preached a sermon, I chose this as a hymn, and I, I consider myself to have, have changed a little since then. And I want us to sing, I, not sing, I want us to actually, we're going to speak. I want us to speak the first stanza of it together. The hymn is called A Fierce Unrest. So ready? First, first verse all together, let us speak it. A fierce unrest seethes at the core of all existing things. It was the eager wish to soar that gave the gods their wings. There throbs through all the worlds that are this heartbeat hot and strong. And shaken systems star by star awake and glow in song. I want you to, to drop down on, that, on, that, on the, the right side of the page to that third line. I want us to read the final line of this hymn. The resolution is that we should sing the stinging discontent that leaps from star to star. A fierce unrest seethes at the core of all existing things. We sing the stinging discontent that leaps from star to star. And so I want to ask you this morning, seething unrest, stinging discontent, be honest, how many of you see yourselves in those lyrics? How many? Any hands? Any hands coming up? A few. Look at this. A few. How many of you think, you know, that's how I approach life? <laughs> I actually see some folks who should be raising their hands but aren't. <laughs> And I want to say, this is a, this is a hymn, this hymn, which, which we would sing as virtue, is a very Unitarian hymn. It's a very American hymn. It's a hymn about that Puritan streak that runs through us and runs through our culture, seething unrest, stinging discontent. I'm surprised a couple of presidential candidates haven't used that as a campaign slogan. <laughs> there, is, there is a good side and a bad side to seething unrest and stinging discontent. The good side is when it comes to heroically battling injustice, when it comes to working for the downtrodden and the dispossessed. I think of Martin Luther King's words, there are certain things in our nation and in the world which I am proud to be maladjusted to, and which I hope all men of goodwill will be maladjusted to until the good societies realize them. Hmm. And yet, if your one and only default setting is unrest and discontent, that probably doesn't work out so well. Unrest and discontent is not the way you ought to treat your wife or your husband. Unrest and discontent is probably not going to make you a good parent. It's harsh to inflict it on a child. It's exhausting and draining to be friends with someone who is restless and discontented. And frankly, if that's the energy that you bring to all of life, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Restless and discontented. I remember um, it was the, the great Puritan minister, Jonathan Edwards, who um, in the mid 1700s, stood up in the pulpit before his congregation. This was the congregation where he told them, you are all sinners in the hands of an angry God. And told them, we are going to stop in this congregation the practice of communion because none of you deserve to take it. <laughs> they actually told them that. Hmm. It didn't last very long after that, by the way. <laughs> Congre they had congregational polity. They, they voted him out quickly after that. Yeah, it was their fierce unrest. So, so it's, just really, it's just really interesting that, that this, this energy, this energy um, 
is 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 really surging in 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 our nation and and that in religious in religious community in religious community it's an energy that is distorting and i would say just just be grateful that that we belong to a faith community that doesn't look upon those in the pews with that with that same sort of unrest and discontent Jonathan Edwards wouldn't last long in this pulpit, and rightfully so. If I had a text to give on my last Sunday in the pulpit before I leave for vacation, it would be Jesus' words found in both Matthew and Luke. His words about the lilies. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so to this restless spirit that pervades in our larger society, in our larger culture, I think we find a a spiritual response, not to put off all sense of restlessness, not to put off all sense of discontent, to be very careful and very discerning with how we allow it to enter our lives and to hold in community what Natalie Merchant, what Ginger sang about, that uh, kind and generous, that thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because if we don't balance, if we don't balance the one with the other, we wind up ourselves something distorted. And so I say... Thank you. At times it's been a hard year. At times it's been a beautiful year. Blessings to you. Amen.